This debate is the battle of ideas debate. Alternative medicine is quackery. It's a provocative title in India. It's a provocative title anywhere, uh, in fact, uh, and deliberately so. Um, we want to have a good discussion um, about the issues, the underlying issues, uh, the principles at stake, the evidence, etc. First, I would just like to say a few words about the battle of ideas. Alongside debating matters, the Battle of Ideas is a flagship project of the Institute of Ideas. It is a major festival that takes place in London, the last weekend of October or the beginning of November, every year at the Royal College of Art. It involves some 250 speakers from across the UK and internationally. Two years ago, we had a major contingent of uh, academics and thinkers from India who made a huge impact on the festival. Um, it involves 75 debates over the course of the weekend and 2,000 participants. It's complemented um, by 30 satellite debates that take place around the UK and as far afield as places like Paris, Frankfurt, Berlin and New York. Most importantly for you, the winner of this weekend, who will be crowned the champion of Debating Matters India 2009-10, will win a trip to London and a VIP treatment at the Battle of Ideas Festival, where you will take on the British champions of debating matters in front of an illustrious audience. Okay, so that's why I wanted to tell you all about it. Now, <clears throat> the purpose of the Battle of Ideas is to uh, examine important issues in a fresh and engaging way, moving beyond stale ideas, old orthodoxies, and to look at things anew. The way we do that is to encourage speakers to speak their mind. Our slogan is free speech allowed. We want people to say what they think and say why they think what they think in order to have a clash of ideas that doesn't just generate heat but generates light. Um, and that is what we hope and intend to do tonight. Um, but let's, without further ado, uh, get on to the matter in hand, the debate. Alternative medicine is quackery. I would like to start with the definitions. Alternative medicine, we would define as a group of diverse medical and healthcare systems, practices and products that are not generally considered part of conventional medicine. And what is a quack? A quack is defined as a pretender to medical knowledge, <laughs> a person who talks profoundly without sound knowledge of the subject discussed. So now that we know what I'm talking about, what I, what I mean by alternative medicine and what I mean by a quack, I will go on to say, why do I consider alternative medicine, not exactly scientific. For that, I will start by defining for you what the main characteristics of modern medicine, of which I am a practitioner, are. The main characteristics are that the methods and techniques used are scientifically testable. A second very important characteristic of modern medicine is that the knowledge is open. Anybody who studies the textbooks and who undergoes practical training in a medical school can acquire the knowledge. You need not be born into a particular sect. You need not be born to particular parents. You need not have the moon shining in the seventh house. Any of those things are not required. The body of knowledge is openly accessible. It is well known and anyone can acquire it provided they undergo the suitable training. Another important characteristic is reproducibility. The medicines and techniques should work every time they're used for the same, if they're used for the right indications, by anybody in any circumstances. What, for, an ex for example, if you have pneumonia and you are treated with a drug which is effective in pneumonia in India, it should work in India. If you use it in the UK, it should work in UK most of the time. There may be rare exceptions where it doesn't work, but as a general rule, they should work. So it should be reproducible. Again, you need not have special knowledge. You need not go into the forest in the night with a strange light and search for roots under the tree, which only you know. None of that is part of modern medicine. It should be reproducible. And I would put it to you that alternate medicine, as I understand it, it lacks some or all of these characteristics. And that is why I hold a strong position that alternative medicine is not a scientific system. <clears throat> Many an example can be given. And the reason why I'm so strongly against alternative medicine is that because it is often posited as an extremely esoteric kind of knowledge where it is person specific, only one person, only if I commune with God, I can give you a cure, or I commune with a strange spirit, I can give you a cure. If I lay my hands on you, 
Patrick the healer, George the healer, Ramakrishnan the healer. It's all person specific. These are dangerous and exploitative practices. When knowledge is supposed to reside only in one person, we know that it can be used as a point of exploitation. Priests have done it for years and medical people have been doing it for years, claiming that they have special knowledge, special communication with God, and therefore <coughs> they only can cure. This is, in my view, a very important characteristic of alternative medicine. And <coughs> some of the important other characteristics are that alternative medicine does not allow scientific testing of its methods. Whenever they are challenged to scientific testing, they will say, we have a different paradigm. What is this different paradigm they refuse to define? Unless you can define your paradigm, unless you allow us, to, or allow everybody to, to test using your paradigm, it becomes secret knowledge. And secret knowledge, by definition, my definition, is exploited. Most important of all, and I'm going to close with this, alternative medicine, when tested, by the methods that are commonly accepted among modern medical practitioners simply does not work. I had the department which is dedicated to traditional medicines. So to that extent, I will try to explain my understanding of the system. People keep asking me, what is the most important challenge of the 21st century? I can say without any doubt, it is healthcare. If you look at a country like United States, you will find it spends about 17% of its GDP on healthcare. But you see, even President Obama is struggling with a healthcare bill even today. It is going to cost the United States 1.3 billion. Even then, you know, the, uh, the number of people who are going to be left out of the system will be around 15 million. That is the ideal healthcare system we are speaking about. You look at UK, it spends about 9% of its GDP. Even then, it's not able to build up an ideal system. The government is pumping a lot of money into this system. You look at the Chinese system, they are spending about 7% of their GDP. Now, coming to India, you look at it, it is not simply not accessible to people. 80% of the people spend their own money. And the 80% of the rural debt in India, it is all due to the cost of health care. So in other words, the whole world is looking for an alternate system which is accessible, at the same time affordable, and which has the quality. These are the three hallmarks of an alternate system. Now, what is the alternate system? What is the alternative which is available? This is where I would like to bring to your attention the strength of the traditional systems. If you look at, I mean, the world over, what has happened is up to the 18th century, three systems were predominant. One was, of course, the Indian system, the other was the Chinese, and the third was the Greek knowledge-based system. And that was refined by the Arabs, and that was it. After the 18th century, you will find that allopathy simply took over the Greek-based system, and it became, one part became the traditional Unani medicine, which is practiced only in India today. Now, why do a person like me, who is a science student like some of you, why am I speaking for the traditional system? Number one, it is because it is a holistic system. Holistic, I mean mind, body, spirit, environment, everything acting together. That is called the holistic system. In Western medicine, in the system which is being practiced in the Western countries, there is no mind. There is nothing called mind in that system. It's not a part of it. That is because Plato, when he propounded his philosophy, the duality of matter and the body, these two things are two different things. And from there emerged the Western science. But in, the, in this particular scenario, that is the traditional systems, uh, the mind is an important part of it. If you look at yoga, if you go deep into yoga, not just the exercise part of it, if you read into yoga, the beautifully, the framework of mind is so beautifully illustrated. The mind is responsible for several of the diseases. So how do you integrate the whole thing? That is one reason why I support the traditional medicine. The second point is that <clears throat> it is highly personalized. As the first speaker said, it's highly personalized. Personalized in the way that if you go to an Ayurveda doctor, what he will look at 
you is that you know he will look at your body constitution he will look at your eyes he will look at your general expressions he will look at your pulse pulse re- reading is a science and an art in ayurveda and he will look at so many other things he will ask you at, uh, what kind of diet are you taking he will ask you so many other personal questions what is your job how stressful it is how is the state of your mind of this only he takes a decision you know how to treat the patient so in other words the ayurveda all these traditional systems actually treat does not treat the disease it treat the person that is the most important difference between the two and third is the western system is function it is structure based there is a hierarchy of structures in the body see the body is there then we have the organs organelles we have the tissues we have the cells we have the subcellular uh, all these parameters are there so it's a structure based system whereas if you look at the traditional system it's a function based system look at ayurveda it says you know the functions the movement all kinds of movements are classified into one and you look at the transformations any kind of the food you eat the thought you have all are transformations third is the storage the form and substance of the person concern all the three and any imbalance in the system it causes the disease don't you think it has got a very beautiful framework and when the microcosm is affected by the macrocosm i mean the whole environment is acting on the body of a human being that is the concept in the ideal traditional systems i am not speaking about quackery quackery is there in allopathy also it's not that you know quackery is limited only to traditional system i am speaking about the highest ideal in a traditional system of medicine so we have all these kinds of things then you will find that you know somebody said here that these are not documented these are personalized knowledge which is not true if you look at ayurveda again or yunani you will find these are all well documented the information received is on the basis of direct observation direct induction the traditional knowledge which has gone from word of mouth all these things have been painstakingly listed and the kind of cures more than 1 lakh medical preparations are listed in ayurveda text and these are testable you can test it on a person depending on the body condition of that person depending on that it may not be the same dose of medicine which is being given to you it may be something else which is given but it is replicable at the same time and what is the proof proof is that the person got better that is the proof what more proof do you want it cannot be validated by a sign that kind of system but it can be validated on its own strength and you know experimentation that's all i have to say thank you very much but anyway i'm i'm a doctor um i'm a psychiatrist so i also treat the whole patient as we've just heard very much so um i treat people as a doctor because i want them to get better and i want to know that if what i do makes a difference i want to know if the treatment that i'm giving does more good than harm i know it will sometimes do harm all treatments do but i want to know overall does this treatment that i'm giving not this one person but all the people that i see with the same problem is it better as a group for them than worse and so i do research and i do clinical trials because i know in a clinical trial that's really the only way i can answer the question is it my treatment that's getting the person better or indeed is it my treatment that might be making them worse as often happens and i do that through the language of science now i'm a stranger to this country this is only my second visit and i'm fascinated to learn more about culture and philosophy beliefs faith and all the things that make this such a fascinating and vibrant society and as much that i don't understand but we're not here talking about faith history culture and metaphysics we're talking about medicine and as george has said medicine is actually a universal language the language of science joins nations it means we can all talk about things like diabetes or depression or cancer or in any language and know what we're talking about and it is truly beautiful it is nature and science is a beautiful thing if you look down a microscope you can see the beauty of it unfolding before you there's nothing metaphysical about it but everything beautiful now in medicine unlike faith or religion to say that something is ancient time honored traditional and so on is in medicine not necessarily an advantage 
In fact, quite often, it's a disadvantage. And that's because, to be honest, until very recently, doctors had very little to offer their patients other than faith and superstition. Because until the middle of the 19th century, most of what doctors did almost certainly made you worse. They had not a clue as to how the body worked at all, and most of the things that they gave patients to get them better almost certainly killed far more than they cured. And it's not surprising, really, because until about 150 years ago, the average lifespan in the world it was indeed, as Hobbes has said, nasty, brutish and short. Suffering and pain and disability was people's lot. That's what they expected, and doctors could do precious little about it. And it is, in fact, in that particular period that came one of the systems of medicine that we're discussing today, which is homeopathy. And it's important to understand where homeopathy came from. It was invented. It was genuinely invented. It wasn't discovered. It was invented by a physician in the 18th century called Hahnemann. And he made one very good observation, because he knew what I just told you, that most of the things that doctors were doing were killing more people than they were curing. And that's not surprising, because the medicine that they were giving contained things like arsenic, strychnine, lead, and so on. And Hahnemann deduced that if you reduce the power of those compounds by diluting them, probably you would do more good than harm. That wasn't because the substances now diluted out would do anything at all, but the things that they'd removed probably were, 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 were no longer there. So he invented dilutions of a hundredfold, a thousandfold, a million, a billionfold, until there was not a trace of the original molecule left. But he also knew, because he was a doctor, that you had to give people some form of understanding, some form of faith, and therefore you couldn't just say, look, there's nothing I can do for you, go away. So he had to give them something, and so he gave them the treatment, the homeopathic treatment, that looked like a drug, but actually wasn't. And, of course, a lot of people then and now, including many of my patients, get better, because most people do get better most of the time. But the truth is, it is nonsense. And it's dangerous nonsense. And you know in your own lives that it's nonsense because you know that the world does not work on the principle that the weaker you make something, the stronger it is. Now, all of you, I'm sure, do not abuse drink and go out drinking like myself and Tony, I'm afraid, often do. <laughs> but just trust me on this one. We have learned in our life that the more we drink, we do not get more sober. We know that if we want to make a drink weaker, we had stuff to it. It doesn't make it stronger. I wish it did, but sadly it doesn't. That's how the world works. You've just heard, I came today on a plane from London. If I'd got on the plane and the pilot had said, I'm your pilot, and I've decided that today, as part of the kind of um, you know, greening of nature, I'm going to fly this plane on homeopathic fuel. I've been diluting it 10, 100, 1,000 times, and now we're going to take off. And, uh, well, you know, fasten your seatbelts. I don't think any of you would have stayed on that plane, would you? And you'd be very wise to do so because you know the world does not work in that way. Your everyday experience, if your iPod is too quiet, you do not turn the sound down to make it louder. That is how the world works. That is how homeopathy does not work and cannot work. It is actually impossible. And as a doctor... I actually believe that we should be truthful to patients. We should talk sense to them. We should not talk nonsense to them. We should not patronize them. We should tell them the truth. And if they're the truth, occasionally you might hurt them. We may not be able to do everything we can for them. So be it. That's the way it is. And it's ironic, of course, to talk about Hahnemann and, uh, 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 and the dilution principle because I actually read, just coming over, Tony sent me a, a, an article from the Times of India which was uh, announcing that the chief minister of Bangalore was advocating the treatment of using Ayurvedic medicine for the treatment of anemia. Now, you might think, well, what's wrong with that? But the problem is, just as Hahnemann knew, Ayurvedic medicine contains very large amounts of lead. 60% of the compounds given here contain le levels of lead, and I have seen, which are very dangerous, and I have seen in my own clinical service at Guy's Hospital, we've had two patients admitted with life-threatening anemia, who it turned out were taking large quantities of Ayurvedic medicine from a, a, a local homeopath. And uh, lead causes anemia. Lead doesn't treat it. That's the tragedy of these things. When we don't talk sense to people, we don't tell them the truth. Then they get damaged and they sometimes die. So what I want to conclude then is another thing that I was reading recently, and this is really about the contradiction between what you want to achieve in a society and what we want to achieve and what is happening. And this was a piece by a biotech PhD, Mira Nandi, who's from the Indian Institute of Technology, 
Unfortunately, she's now gone, like so many others have, to America to do her research there in biotech. But what she was talking about was the disconnect between the ambition to become a science superpower, which you're well on the way to achieving, and, uh, and the reality of the continuing grip of superstition, I quote here, superstition and life-threatening pseudoscience on the health of India. He sa she says this is not about faith at all. This is different. Indian scientists must apply scientific methodology to those aspects of traditional spiritual me medical practice that step directly into the turf of modern science and medicine. Not faith, not metaphysics, that's fine, but science and medicine. And she should concludes that Indian scientists must challenge the substantiated and misleading health claims that have been made for yoga and Ayurveda. And I agree with that. We should talk sense to our patients, not nonsense. I'm a medical graduate with a legitimate medical degree and therefore cannot be called a quack. Having studied public health, having studied perceptions of various communities on how they look at their own health, their aspirations for their own well-being and how they deal with their health problems, I am in a position where I don't take a position either for modern medicine or for alternative medicine. I think I need to look at both of them and see what benefit we can get out of both because that is the position the communities take. And I think they've worked out the balance that they find, they find most suitable for their own well-being and their own health. What does that mean? And I, I'm not trying to romanticize what communities do. They work within their constraints, both of exposure, of knowledge, and of the resources that they have at hand. How would we define alternative medicine? One is the position that modern medicine defines for us. What we need to recognize is that any definitions that we make are given by the dominant science of the time. It's the dominant experts who give you definitions which are legitimate and given uh, the official stamp. But there are meanings that come from cultures. And cultures give definitions which would not necessarily have a stamp, but which the community at large sees as of value. And they've seen that not out of ignorance, it's out of their own experience, experience which is tested in their own way and they are rational human beings. 70% of people across the world still use some form or other of alternative medicine in their lives. So there is a question of what exactly are we calling alternative. Uh, besides that, uh, if one, you know, the question that very often gets raised by people who oppose the use of alternative medicine at all is that people continue to use it for a certain set of reasons. And I have a list here from various studies, which says one, it's ignorance of people, two, it's placebo effects, three, it's distrust of conventional medicine, four, it's fear of side effects, five, it's cost, and six, it's fraud. Can we look at all of this and say whether this applies to modern medicine or not? Do all of us know about modern medicine or are we ignorant about it? Do we are there placebo effects in modern medicine or not? I was taught that a, a, cold, a treated cold lasted for a week and a non-treated one lasted for seven days. Distrust of conventional medicine. That distrust has come because of the experience with modern medicine and not only because of ignorance. Fear of side effects. I think we'd all say that's a genuine fear. One, we need to be told about it. All medicines will have both benefits and gains and uh, ne the negative side effects as well. But we need to be told about it, we need to be, uh, have all our checks and balances in place, and that's something the doctors that we treat us and that we have, have created a distrust about that in us. The costs are something we are all wearing, including the US and President Obama, so therefore we don't need to talk about that. And fraud is something, again, we have enough in the newspapers from various systems, and all of them, therefore, can be seen in all systems today. So what I'm talking about is therefore, what is the reason for the dominant system calling this, the other systems, quackery? And there can be a number of them. One is commercial interest. Very clearly, it's a conflict of interest when patients move from one system to the other. But it's larger than that. There's a battle of worldviews, of knowledge systems, of epistemology of knowledge systems. And that's not something that we've just fabricated out of the air. There is a philosophy of knowledge, there is philosophy of science, and there are various ways in which different sciences can be looked at. And today, with climate change, with the whole planet being in a state of crisis, 
I think we need to rethink the way we're looking at modern science and development and technology. If we don't do that, we're putting the whole world and this planet under threat. And, sci and medicine is one of those sciences, which is not to say it doesn't have its benefits. I've been trained in that, I use those benefits, and I make others use them as well. But I also know that I don't have the arrogance to say that I have all the knowledge and the, I'm the only source of knowledge. There are other forms of knowledge which need to be used. Therefore, all I'm asking for is let's not use double standards. Thank you. Let's look at the question of homeopathy. Simon's raised the point that it's it deliberately diluted to, down to a point at which there is only a single molecule with no effect whatsoever. That was the whole intention of homeopathy. Um, I watched an advert in my uh, bedroom the other night. Um, it came from the department of Ayush. Um, it was a, a, a young mother with a young child, a, a box of pills that looked like drugs, uh, and it was saying, simple, effective, effective, safe. I, I was not being dishonest when I was uh, trying to place my arguments before all of you. See, all the systems of medicines which have been traditionally used, they have been time-tested. They have been tested again and again on people. People, the communities have been able to witness for themselves. It's not that, you know, we are duping something. And the homeopathy, for example, he said, you know, it's not found, it's only placebo effect and things like that. But, you know, we have we have so many cases reported before us, very scientifically reported before us, which says that homeopathy has very good effect. Similarly, Yunani system, which is also, you know, based on the Greek system and the Arabic system. And it is very, very useful in treating skin diseases. I have myself seen several of the patients who are getting well in some of our hospitals. And we have taken up a number of research projects and, uh, you know, we could show it to these people that the cutting edge research have been taken in this area and they have come to the conclusion that these, uh, these medicines are very effective. But as I told you earlier, the only problem is that, you know, it is personalized. You, you cannot give 10 milligrams to 10 people and prove something. It is a personalized, it depends on your body constitution, your <coughs> state of health, your mental state, all these things. So I can directly tell you that our department was set up only because these systems are to be promoted because they have been found effective for centuries together by use by the people of the country. Let me remind you how I earn my living. I'm a psychiatrist. So actually, I do ask people about how they feel, what jobs they do, how their marriage is, issues like that. That's what I do for a living. I have no problems with that at all. But I'm also going to be treating conditions. Because if I wasn't doing that, if, if every single person was completely different in every way, there would be no point in ever going to medical school. There would be no point in ever learning anything because you could never take anything from any person to help you treat the next patient. And it's because people also have things in common, like perhaps unhappy marriages or depression or anxiety or high blood pressure or cancer. It's where we have commonalities, that's when we can treat people. Because if everyone was totally unique, we could then do nothing. And your opinion would be as good as mine as anyone else's. And the second issue is, yes, homeopathy treats many of my patients and they get better. And that's great. But that isn't to do with homeopathy. Because when we do randomized trials, when we blind the trials so that neither the person nor the doctor knows whether they're getting the real thing or the placebo pill, in those trials, I'm afraid I have to disagree here, homeopathy is found to be ineffective. And the better the trial, the higher the quality of the trial, the less effective it is compared to nothing. And to be absolutely honest, it would be really remarkable if, the other way, if it was the other way around, because by definition, homeopathy does contain nothing. That's the way it is. That's the way the world works. Okay? There are not alternative against conventional medicine. There are treatments that work and treatments that don't. And the boring bit here where you have to start looking at the trials and the statistics and do what we do, which we run a clinical trials unit, in those trials, these kind of treatments do not work. They work in some people, sure, but that's no basis of a healthcare system because they do no better than if we hadn't done anything at all. I think there is a fundamental difference between the two sides of the argument here, that is between Simon and, 
and me on one side and Ritu and Jalaja on the other side. And the fundamental difference is on the question of how science works. What do you see as science? What is the scientific method? Is it because when we look at, the, at science as I understand it, and the way that science is practiced, which Ritu called the dominant method, and these are just, that's just name calling. Because when you want to offer an alternative paradigm, you can't just name call. You can't just say you're arrogant. You have to say, what is your alternative paradigm? What are your tests which I can do and show that your system works? I will give you a very good paper. Australian oncologists followed 2,337 terminal cancer patients in palliative <laughs> care. On an average, they died after five months. But 1% were still alive after five years. So if this 1% were to be taking, as people often do when they have cancer, Reiki or aromatherapy or Ayurveda or Yunani, the credit goes to these systems but actually it's the natural history of the disease. A gave to homeopathy, the wart fell off. What we actually have to do is we have to follow a number of people with warts, give one set of people homeopathy, give another set of people the, uh, the standard treatment and see which works better. That's, if you have an alternative method, if you're offering an alternative method as she called it arrogance, I say it's, it is a scientifically testable method. If you're offering me an alternative method, please tell me what that method is. Do not tell me that traditionally people have had, you know, been using it for hundreds of years. The Aztecs lost their empire because they believed for hundreds of years that when the sun went over, the world would end. It's very dangerous to do these things. It is, the, why I'm so passionate about is this, these systems, I mean, this kind of fudging of data, fudging of knowledge systems, fudging of scientific evidence is dangerous for people. I am as much a respecter of the other human being as Ritu is. But I refuse to believe that just because for hundreds of years they believed the earth is flat, I should say, traditional knowledge system, earth is flat, if I walk to the edge I will fall off. Sorry, I know the earth is a sphere. And how many ever elderly people in the country are going to tell me that the earth is flat? Sorry, I'm not going to believe it. I need evidence. I need testability. I need you to do the test, me to do the test, get the same answer. If I put copper, copper and... Uh, Sulfuric acid together, you should get copper sulfate, I should get copper sulfate. Not traditional medicine man will get magic remedy. Okay. This, you know, we have published a number of research publications which I can place before you and we have collaborative research with National Institute of Health in the United States. We have collaborative <coughs> research and we have set up a research center at the University of Mississippi and we are, you know, we are uh, doing collaborative research with a number of universities abroad. Do you think if they don't believe in science, they will come and have collaborative research with us? Top research institutions in the country like the Bose Institute, the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, IITs, all of them are having joint collaboration with us in research studies. And publications have already been made. I can share it with you if you like. That is the first point I would like to mention. Second thing is that out of 2,000 diseases which are generally known to mankind, we have been able to find solution I, through any of the system only for 40% of the diseases. The remaining 60%, even the biomedical science has not been able to touch it. And many of the diseases, lifestyle diseases, the allopathy has no role to play. It has no cure to offer. It can minimize it, but it cannot cure it. For example, diabetes. You take cardiovascular diseases, you take any of the lifestyle, um, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, and I can challenge any money, uh, uh, rheumatoid arthritis has excellent cures in, our, in Ayurveda and Yunani. Many people have been cured, and we are into the research studies, I mean, like he says, you know, the kind of the so-called scientific studies. I personally feel that one system cannot be justified, like allopathy cannot be justified by Ayurveda. Ayurveda cannot be justified by the, the clinical trials, so-called clinical trials of the Western medicine. We have to design our own kind of clinical trials for which we have already set up a group that will come out with the kind of clinical trials which we want to do. One more thing I wanted to tell you, well, some information. There are 200, over 200,000 deaths in United States alone due to the unneeded surgeries, hospital infection, side effects. How do we answer for them? 
and the first cause of death in United States is due to cancer or you know uh, it could be uh, due to cardiovascular problems and cancer but the third cause is due to hospital intervention and the fourth cause is due to adverse uh, drug reaction this has come out in a prestigious journal called JAMA Journal of American Medicine it's a prestigious journal what do you have to say about it so you condemning one system as quackery and saying that the other system has all the merits it is not correct and one small thing more about the dilution in homeopathy I wanted to tell you the principle of vaccination has been borrowed from that thing you know the dilution the dilution principle is used in vaccination laying out what the other sciences are without having read about them without having looked at them is what the arrogance of the dominant does we have what I talked about when I said what's was a trial it was not something which was anecdotal at all we have Shar Sutra, which is an Ayurvedic practice of treating fistulas in a unit in the All India Institute of Medical Sciences today because it was tested out and found by the ICMR to be an effective method and therefore a unit installed there and now therefore we have it in practice across the country. These are just two examples that I'm giving you and there can be umpteen others which have been tested and tried out. The psychoneuroimmunology studies being done by modern scientists are showing the benefits of yoga and a whole lot of other forms of alternative therapy for a whole range of problems. And that's something which is, should be part of the understanding of modern science and its methods. You're ignoring all the adverse effects uh, of Western medicine, unneeded intervention, side effects from drugs. Um, can you answer that accusation? And the point that Ritu made originally about what is effective for communities when they have no access to any other form of medicine? Okay, well, well, first of all, I actually said all treatments do harm. I actually said I know that my treatments do harm. That's not the issue. The only thing that never does harm is homeopathy because it's not a treatment. The question is, does it do more good than harm? So, of course, the medicines that I use, which is not very often when I do, have side effects. Of course they do. If they didn't, they wouldn't be drugs. That's not the question. The question is, is overall the benefit greater than the risk? That's the only question we ask. So we are obsessed with side effects at all times. The second question is really is, is the pediatrician question, the pediatricians who practice allopathic medicine at work and come home and practice homeopathy. Well, I do the same. I do exactly the same. I'm a conventional scientific doctor at work because that's what you expect of me. But when I come home and my kids bruise themselves in the playground or fighting, as they often do, I kiss it better. That's what I do. But I don't think that that's medicine. I didn't need to go to medical school to do that. I just needed to be a parent and to love my children. They're effective, but it isn't medicine, and it's not what we're talking about. So, of course, we have different ways of dealing with different problems, but we mustn't confuse them and thinking, mixing up science and love. And the third one is about effectiveness. Now, you use the example of rheumatoid arthritis, and you use the example of JAMA, a top journal, and this is where I've been boring. There have been seven trials of Ayurvedic medicine and rheumatoid arthritis, which have been in JAMA, in the journal you mentioned, and I'm sorry, they didn't work. I'm sorry, they didn't. That's just the way it is. It would be lovely if it's the other way around, but you need to see the world as it is, not as how you would wish it to be. You said that alternative sources of uh, medicine, like homeopathy, is responsive to the environment in which the individual lives. But what happens when the cause of disease or sickness is not your environment, when it's your own body, like cancer? What is your uh, medicine then? The ones who are speaking in favor of alternative medicine seem to me at least to be a bit on the defensive, where I thought actually those who were representing the side of mainstream allopathic medicine should actually be very much on the defensive and apologetic. Um, I have been visiting hospitals lately because several of my senior relatives have been ill. And what really struck me at the hospitals where the modern doctors and their medicine system operate is how little they know about the human body and how sad they come across when they're faced with, you know, situations, grave situations, critical situations. They have no compunction in admitting after taking thousands and thousands of rupees that we don't really understand how the human body works. You know, if you can, you know, kind of shovel in 10 lakhs more, I can give it another go, but it will be at best a guess. 
Now that's that's the situation, you know. And um, they are also not sorry to say that, you know, why don't you pray to God? You know, miracles happen. And I keep hearing about miracles more often from modern medical doctors. Uh, so alternative medicine need not be always something as abstract as someone communicating with God and curing people. In many cases, Western medicine has proven its validity and its relevance. For example, something as simple as a household remedy like turmeric. It has been proven that the particles of turmeric bind themselves around the proteins and free radicals associated with cell mutations that lead to cancer. It has also been clinically proven that it prevents septicemia in case of, uh, in case of uh, bleeding. Also, sir, uh, the, the very fact, the alternative medicine is more oriented towards the issue of prevention rather than cure. It, it, it is a more holistic approach. So if that holistic approach is integrated with our conventional mainstream medicine, which is more cure-oriented, I think uh, there is nothing better than that. Uh, even something which is as abstract as somebody communicating with God and healing people, which, which I'm, I'm very sure that nobody in this hall might believe in that. And you, you know, we all hear of legends and people being cured by miracles. But one thing I'd like to say here is that when, when somebody has faith in that person communicating with God and healing them, the top scientists in the, the top uh, scientists in the field of quantum physics in many of the top universities in the world have proven the fact that a person's subconscious beliefs do have a physical effect on the world around him. Because in the past few years, quantum mechanics has proven that reality is nothing but uh, reality comes from energy and energy comes from consciousness. And they have proven that thought can have a physical effect on the world around them. What is unorthodox today might be orthodox tomorrow. So instead of dismissing something new as quackery, why not have a more inquisitive approach? Uh, Dr. Thomas was talking about the essential char characteristics of modern medicine and the essential characteristics of alternative medicine. But uh, yeah, they are very different. And uh, one magical thread that's like connecting both are the very f is the very fact that both offer cures to diseases. Bo the common goal, the common good goal is that both save lives at the end of the day. And one difference is that while, uh, while modern medicine, I wouldn't call, call it conventional, modern, modern medicine has been given a chance to, uh, you know, to bloom, while after a point, uh, alternative medicine hasn't. So, I mean, uh, don't you think that both modern medicine and, and alternative medicine should go hand in hand? I am especially interested in this question of prevention. We hear about it a lot in the UK. We're constantly told about the importance of prevention rather than cure. So I think that's a very interesting question. And also this question of why not both? The National Health Service in the UK has endorsed complementary medicine, or appears to have done quite publicly. So why not both? Well, let's start with prevention. You said you hear a lot about it in the UK. Of course you do, and you hear a lot about it from doctors. It's hard to get a doctor who doesn't tell you to exercise more, drink less, be less stressed, lose weight and eat better. My wife's a general practitioner, she probably tells people that 30 times a day. They don't listen, I'm afraid, that's the rather sad. But there's nothing alternative or conventional about that. That is standard medical practice and standard medical advice. All of it, by the way, based on sound randomized control trial evidence. So there's, no, there's nothing novel or strange about that at all. And the second thing is, I don't think you still fully grasp the point we're making here about the difference between dogma and evidence. None of us have any problem in any treatment that works. And there are many examples in the history of medicine of treatments that have catastrophically not worked, which is to answer your point. And in my profession in psychiatry, we've probably been as gullible and as stupid as any in some of the things that we have done in the past. We used to give insulin coma to patients with schizophrenia. It killed a lot of them. But we stopped. And we stopped on the basis of a very famous trial done in 1953 that proved that actually it not only was it ineffective, it did more harm than good. And now any doctor who tried to do that would find themselves losing their license immediately. And the same applies to other treatments that I was taught in medical school to give steroids to people with cerebral malaria. A trial done in Thailand showed it killed more children than it cured. And so we stopped. We thought it worked. It didn't. We changed. But when studies have shown that looking in the iris cannot diagnose kidney disease or spleen disease, as is claimed, the people who make those claims, as has also been shown, continue to do so. 
They do not change their beliefs or their practice on the basis of the evidence. That's the difference that we're talking about. It's the ability to move from dogma to science and to say, yeah, it sounded good at the time, but the evidence shows that it isn't, so we move on, we research, we try and progress. That's the difference that we're talking about. And nobody says that this, you know, this thing that, uh, that there is no, no such thing as a placebo effect, that holding the hand of your patient, the bedside manner is not important. Nobody says that. Studies have proved that it works. But I do disagree when someone says that quantum physics has proved. That's a dangerous statement to make. Quantum physics has proved nothing of the sort. Many physicists to my know will turn around and around and around if they heard this. Because it has not proved that subconscious beliefs are, you know, this is the, 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 because people do not understand quantum physics, it's a very difficult body of work. This is the time when they put it together. The Maharishi unified field theory. He has proved what Einstein couldn't prove, put all the three together and he has a unified field. Where is this unified field? It has been tested umpteen times and proved not to work. These are straw man arguments. The young man there said, both save lives and therefore give them a chance to bloom. We're all for it. But I am against a person like the South African Prime Minister <laughs> saying that saying a prayer or whatever it was will work for AIDS and therefore condemning millions of his countrymen mm. to death because he refused to accept that the currently available best treatment for AIDS, which is AZT, was the effective method and alternative methods work. They did not. They killed million B. That is what we are against here. You have to understand, for me, alternative medicine does not mean the entire body of work of Ayurveda. All I'm saying is, test it. If it works, we will accept it. All will accept it. But Charak also gave principles and said that I have only looked at something like 600 plants. There are thousands out there, which many others, and he in fact said that the shepherds and the forest person knows much more about them than I do. And therefore, they are the ones who can actually teach us more about it. And down the line, these principles should be used to find more and more. And that's what we should be doing today, using those principles to identify presently available resources to be able to provide the kind of medicine with those principles. It's principles which deal with the context. The universality of medicine that modern medicine claims does not come through when we look at public health. HIV that he talked about, it's not the same across the world. There are different forms of the epidemic. It's well recognized that there are different patterns and they have different needs. AZT is not a universally acceptable form. It has actually changed around. What, he has caricaturized what the president said at that point. He did not say alternative medicines either. He said something very different. What did he say? He, he was in fact talking about the fact that it is not only HIV. What, what, what was the result of that whole dialogue? The dialogue that happened around the South African president was that just HIV alone will not do. Any infectious disease, just the germ is not the reason for the disease. We, most of us will have the TB bacteria within us and we know that, but we don't have the disease. Most it has, the body HIV. has to be ready. The body has to, can, can I just, can just a moment, George, can I just finish? I, I've let you speak. Let me do that myself now. What came out of that was that there is an environment and a social context which allows the HIV virus to spread. That context was required for the pandemic to occur. And therefore, it has to both have to be looked at, including the situations of malnutrition, etc., etc., of high other infectious disease, which becomes conducive for the HIV virus to thrive and spread. That's the issue of it, and making it the answer being only AZT is the problem. The fact that we have only bullets, silver bullets for diseases, is the problem with modern medicine. And that's what the issue was about. It wasn't about whether it was one or the other, whether HIV was there or not. So that's the kind of sense that I would make of this. Consensus would be possible on certain issues, yet like he said, absolutely like he said, what we can prove works. There would be evidence of that, and thereby we recognize what are the strengths of certain systems and strengths of other systems for other problems. And that's where we'd have to be sensit sensitized providers of each system to the strengths of the other. And then we would probably recognize that, yes, I cannot deal with this, but at other one, maybe I refer my patients there, mm -hmm. and they might benefit from it. So cross-respect cross of other systems and their strengths, based on evidence, 
and thereby allowing cross-referral is where we could go so that each system can grow with its own strength within its own scientific framework and thereby we have different knowledge systems which benefit, which grow with their own strengths. And the, why they've not grown is the additional question has its own logic. There was colonialism, there was sub political support of systems which has always allowed systems to grow or not grow. Number one, when the British came to India, they found a very beautiful system which is working here. Yeah, both Yunani and all these traditional systems were working very well. When they started supporting the local systems, initially when they came, then at about the same time, the drug industry started developing in UK. And slowly the drugs started coming into the colonial markets. By slowly, the British shifted their view from the traditional medicine into integrated medicine. The first medical college which was set up was a kind of integrated medical college. After that, once the drugs took their prime position in India, then, you know, these systems were pushed aside. Secondly, coming to the preventive care, I must tell you, all these traditional systems are really based on preventive care. So, therefore, the onus of, you know, treating the disease is on the patient, not on the doctor. And I will tell you a small story. Recently, I had been to Kerala. I had the good fortune to visit an, an Ayurveda practitioner who is 90 years old. And he practices Gandhi and Ayurveda. It's a very strange combination. So he doesn't take any money from people, etc. He, he, what he advocated, I asked him, what do you think about the modern medical system? What is your opinion? He said, the modern medical system, I have nothing to say about it. But I will say that Ayurveda is going to survive for years together. That is because medicine forms only a small part of the treatment system. It is the lifestyle, it is a mind, it is the body, it is the diet, it is the way you exercise your body. That is more important in these systems. Medicines form only a small part of it. Now finally I will answer one or two points which he raised. He said some of the medicines contain high metals. I must tell you only 10% of the Ayurvedic medicines are metallic preparation. The metals are through a process converted from toxic to non-toxic and that is non-toxic to the body. I am very happy to announce before this forum, we have conducted, our department had taken up a research with CSIR, ISMR, I, uh, ICMR and ourselves. It's called the Golden Triangle Project. It has now come to the conclusion that the eight basmas which have metallic content reported in the JAMA article about which he spoke, that has been disproved. It has been tested on animals found to be very safe. Most of the medicines in Ayurveda, Yunani, etc. are nothing but food. Nothing but food. They are not chemicals which are harmful to the body. They are in tune with nature. And the last point is that why I support the traditional medicines is because we are taken back to nature through these systems. Many of the diseases, especially the mind, diseases of the mind occur because we are removed far away from nature. And these systems take us back to the nature through the treatment, through the lifestyle, through the mind. So I think this is a holistic view of life. There is no comparison between a medical system and a way of life. Let us not compare both. Uh, can everything in this world be scientifically proven? Everything? You can't, you're like uh, alternative systems may have their own specific strong theory behind it. Right? Due to which it works against diseases. So, like for example, Ayurveda, the principles are clear. Okay, the way you make your medicine might be unique, it might be all that, but how so, since everything has its own specific theory and you can't always prove everything scientifically, how can you call alternative systems quackery? Whether any, everything can be scientifically proven, the basis of science is that we try to validate all methods just because a method is not valid, uh, validated by a, um, a method today it does not mean it won't happen in the future, but we have to have the fundamental concept that we need to validate it. Otherwise, we are in the hands of charlatans who will claim that they have special knowledge. And that's an important issue, the understanding of science. The problem is that understanding science, understanding trials, understanding blinding, randomization, and statistics is hard work. People much prefer to believe that if purple smoke will help them. This is easy and lazy. But 
you essentially must understand science. It is not something which is esoteric, something which is hidden. It is available to every one of us. We must make the effort because that is an important issue for taking care of the future of humankind. It's a very, very important issue. Uh, somebody asked when the colonialism and the allopathic drugs developed, why was it able to push out Ayurveda and other things? What I wanted to tell you was that at that particular time, uh, the world over, the health of people uh, was very, very poor at that time, not only in India, yeah, all over the world it was the same. Slowly the allopathic drug, and uh, as explained by my friend Ritu Priya, see the power relations also count, eh, count greatly. What the people at the power positions, they advocate, that became the law. So more number of people in power positions started promoting allopathy. So therefore, naturally, even the Indian government today, even in my department, I know it very well, that many of the things which we would like to do, that, you know, the allopathy has taken over those areas. So that is simple power relation that has been the cause of it. Number two, now what was the other uh, question? Why, uh, you know, time has changed? Even now, will the theory of Ayurveda work? work? This is the question. My answer is that the framework of Ayurveda is so superior it doesn't recognize any bacteria or virus. It speaks about body immunity. And what the, it does is the drugs or the lifestyle or the mind or something improves the immunity of the person concerned. So with the result that that is forever. I mean, come X disease, H1N1, uh, the bird flu or any other disease, let it come. We, uh, what we are trying to do through the alternate system is to raise the immunity level of the person. So any disease coming doesn't matter. It's the same person, but he is able to, he or she is able to deal with all the diseases. That is the beauty of the framework of Ayurveda and other tradition systems of medicine. Just two points, really. First, this issue of it's natural, it must be good. The poisons used by Lucretia Borgia were natural, but they didn't do any good. Tuberculosis is natural. The drugs that treat it are chemical. Tsunamis are natural. So the fact that something natural is, is irrelevant. Okay, that's not the issue we should be talking about. But I want just to end on a serious note because despite it, this is a very serious topic and I'm afraid I'm going to have to go back to HIV and AIDS because that's an example of, of how much harm you can do through embracing what is, I'm afraid, anti-science and pseudoscience. Mubeki did say that HIV wasn't the cause of AIDS. He had his reasons, but that's what he said. He also said that nutrition would prevent mothers from transmitting HIV to, to the fetus. And indeed, a vitamin salesman from Germany made millions and millions of pounds in South Africa selling vitamin preparations to pregnant HIV mothers, telling them that it wouldn't, that they would therefore protect their children from HIV. It didn't. The children died. The HIV epidemic, of course, has different forms around the world, and that's according to the way it's transmitted. When it's transmitted through intravenous drug abuse, through gay sex or heter heterosexual sex, it will take a different form and will infect different people. And clearly, the preventative strategies needed to deal with that are going to be different, and they can be evaluated, again, using scientific methodology. But none of that gets away from the fundamental truthful fact. HIV causes AIDS. AZT can treat it, not nutrition, not meditation, not yoga, and not herbal medicines, all of which have been promoted and claimed to do that. I can understand why Mabeki said what he did, because the truth was that South Africans couldn't afford the treatments that would work. But surely the answer is not to talk nonsense to his people, not to delude them, but to perhaps indeed to draw attention to the political and economic processes that have been mentioned as to why they couldn't afford it. Fine, because at least that had a chance of addressing the problem. But telling them that it didn't work, and that nutrition would protect children from HIV transmitted by their mothers was a lie, a dangerous lie, and a wicked thing to do. You know, you've got evidence now that the life expectancy was higher before we had the colonial empire before us, and it actually went down in that period. And then again, it's from the 1900 onwards that life expectancy increased, but life expectancy does not increase with medical systems. That's absolutely clear and there's enough evidence across the globe, whether in Europe or in the US or in India or anywhere else. It's because of life conditions, it's because of nutritional conditions and so on and so forth. Medicine decreases suffering. It does not increase life expectancy until you reach the point of living standards which are well above what we have today. 
Therefore, medicine of any kind can only decrease the suffering of people who have illness. It's the other conditions of life which will improve life expectancy. And therefore, we should keep this context of both, whether it's alternative medicine or the other, very much in mind, and then look at the issues of Baba Ramdev, for example, how he's able to motivate so many people to do what even modern medicine would say. I absolutely agree with him when he says that modern medicine also has its preventive. And lifestyle issues of hypertension, of cardiac, would be very, very similar. But Baba Ramdev is able to get so many thousands and millions across this country actually adopt those practices, which, as he said here, he's not sure his patients are ready to do. So there is some kind of factors which work beyond just the medical biomedicine that RCTs can show us, that the randomized clinical trial shows you effectiveness on the ground in real life is what effectiveness is about, not in the lab.